Welcome back, everyone. It's Michael LeBlanc, Director and Senior Portfolio Manager at Canaccord Ingenuity Wealth Management. And thank you again for joining us on Tuesday, October 27th. Uh, let that think in. It's already October 27th. We're almost at Halloween and into November and heading into the, uh, the holiday stretch going into December. It seems like, uh, seems like time is just passing us by. Uh, but thank you for joining us uh, for our weekly update on everything market and uh, finance and really anything news related that we cover during the week. I like to keep everyone up to date. Uh, keep, in, keep in mind everything that we cover here today is for information purposes only, not to be taken as advice. Always do your own due diligence or seek the advice of a professional before applying any strategies to your portfolio or to your financial plan. And as always, you can reach us at mikeonmoney.com where you can uh, find our email address, our phone number, uh, or even uh, book things right into our calendar. You can also find links to all our other videos and educational material that might help you out in your research or just for your own information. Uh, so we are broadcasting this over Zoom and you are muted and your uh, cameras are uh, muted as well or turned off. So uh, you don't have to worry about moving around or making any noise. It, uh, it won't come through. But if you do want to ask a question, you should find that little Q&A button there where you can click on it, type in your question. Uh, we usually try to get to it during these sessions. Uh, if we don't have time or I yammer on too much and go over time, uh, I will follow up with you uh, for sure and, and make sure your question gets answered. If you think of it afterwards, as always, you can just uh, contact us afterwards. If you're watching this on the replay, uh, just give us a call, give us an email, or as I mentioned, go to mikeonmoney.com and you can find us there. So let's dive into what's going on in the news. Uh, obviously, everything is election related. We did have our BC election here over, over the last week, so I know that might have flown under the radar uh, with, uh, you know, kind of the hype around the U.S. election going on. And we almost saw a, a federal non-confidence uh, snap election being called, uh, which I guess is still always a threat with the minority uh, Trudeau government. So... Uh, uh, but anyway, BC, we had an election where the NDP uh, were operating under a minority government, now have a majority government. Uh, so we'll see how that, uh, how that plays out. But uh, I, think, I think most British Columbians were, were happy during this pandemic to be status quo, which is uh, probably why we saw that outcome. So what we're seeing in the U.S. Uh, coming up this week, we're looking for U.S. durable goods for September numbers coming out. Uh, the U.S. S&P core logic. Uh, uh, home price index uh, coming out and we did get some news on kind of the the, the, the new homes numbers or the residential numbers uh, last week which we'll touch on today. Uh, the U.S. Conference Board of Consumer Confidence for October is due out and of course we are in uh, earnings season. We mentioned last week a lot of companies coming out with uh, with earnings. Uh, not not great time to be coming out kind of the last week before the election because we have all this pessimism around uh, what might happen around the election, people, uh, or the markets anyway, um, lean into war, one win versus another win, what might happen, what might not happen. But, uh, but we are expecting Microsoft's numbers to come out, and we saw a couple of numbers from, uh, from last week come out. Uh, and uh, overall, so, you know, a lot of the companies we're watching are good. Obviously, some industries are, are getting hit a little bit harder, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, as today, we're going to take a focus on what has performed. So what companies uh, have performed well so far in 2020 or the best so far in 2020? Really, we'll focus on sectors. We did a whole video of this in the summer, uh, kind of the first half of the year, kind of what sectors were performing best. Uh, not much change in that front, but a few interesting names that are popping up. Uh, it really kind of gives us some insight into uh, where money, uh, where the money is shifting as far as investments go for the year. So we'll take a look at that at the end. Uh, as far as the election uh, latest, uh, election officials are warning about widespread suspicion email, suspicious email campaign. Uh, so this goes to last week. Uh, there was a lot of controversy over um, FBI investigations into Iran and Russia. Uh, over threatening emails, uh, basically uh, voter, some voter registration data was hacked. So some people in the U.S. were being kind of threatened if they didn't vote one way 
or another, um, that their, their information was going to be leaked uh, and, and, you know, various other threats. So um, more, uh, more concerns around that and obviously uh, more investigation into that. Uh, there's also a lot of concern around the, the, the head of the FBI who's doing the, uh, the investigation as to uh, whether he's trying to use that to push forward his political party. So we'll see that play out. I think we're going to see a lot of controversy around this election. We've already seen a ton, and, and now we're down to the last week. So uh, not a shock that we're going to see more there. Uh, stock investors, uh, you know, have started to bet a little bit on a Biden uh, victory and looking for a robust stimulus. Um, I don't know if I would, I would bet uh, yet. Uh, I think yesterday's market kind of shows that the market is still pretty uncertain, uh, as we'll um, talk about yesterday's pullback in the market and continued a little bit today. Uh, but uh, either party is going to put a stimulus, you know, second round of stimulus package uh, out after the election whether it's Republican or Democrat. Obviously, they will be uh, focused on different areas, depending on which one wins, uh, which we did a whole video into to those sectors and which areas uh, would do better under Democrat versus uh, Repo Republicans. Uh, so, you know, but we are starting to see the market trying to figure out exactly which way it's going to go. And, and that's very normal in the last couple of weeks before a disputed election or, 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 or an uncertain election. So, uh, so wouldn't be overly concerned about that uh, as we see it go in. In fact, we've been talking about uh, how things generally slow down going into the election. Uh, CFOs brace for more tension, uh, trade tensions, uh, you know, with potential more tariffs after the election. Obviously, tariffs have been a little bit uh, sidebarred, uh, being uh, focus has been on the election campaigns. Uh, so we'll see a return to that. Uh, Amy Coney uh, Barrett uh, was sworn in as the new Supreme Court Justice. A uh, big surprise there uh, to no one uh, as the Senate uh, jammed that through at record speed uh, to get it in before, uh, before the election, just in case the Republicans don't win. Uh, Doug Jones uh, faces long odds uh, to keep his Senate, uh, Senate seat. Now, keep in mind, uh, we are, you know, when we talk about the... Uh, the Republican or, or Democratic president, but we're also uh, looking at a Senate vote here. So uh, we could see a scenario where the Democrats win the presidency, but they lose the Senate, <clears throat> which, you know, as, as we've seen under Obama's second term, can really handcuff anything that happens. Or we could see Republican win the presidency and lose the Senate, um, which again would be really handcuffing uh, Trump in particular uh, without the Senate back. And, you know, a lot of things, a lot of things can happen. Uh, you know, he wouldn't have fared so well on the impeachment uh, if he didn't have the Senate behind him. So, so we got to keep an eye on that as well. It's really important to know uh, which party is going to have the majority in the Senate as well as the president's, the presidency. <laughs> Mail-in ballot, ballot in has been uh, fueling a uh, historic early voting numbers. Uh, the last total I saw was. 40% uh, of the total vote from 2016 has already been uh, been received, either through early polls or uh, mailing uh, ballots. Uh, so, which is good. People are getting out to vote. Uh, whatever the outcome is going to be, uh, having historic turnout for the election uh, is um, it's going to be the will of the people, right? The, 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 you can't come. We can't complain about the outcome if the majority of people are out there voting and expressing their uh, their choice. So uh, we'll keep a close eye on those numbers, but it, it looks like it's going to be a, uh, a record-breaking turnout as far as the number of votes being cast for this election. Uh, the seven-day average coronavirus cases in the U.S. has reached an all-time high. Single days, over 80,000. In some cases, almost 90,000. Obviously, a lot of concern about a second wave. Uh, well, we're in a second wave. Uh, whether you look at the Canadian numbers, European numbers, or the U.S. numbers, we're definitely in the second wave. In fact, in the U.S., they're calling it a third wave uh, because they, they didn't have that lull that most countries had for a while. Uh, so a lot of concerns around that as uh, potential new close downs uh, might happen in the U.S. Uh, could Trump uh, have an election comeback? Now, say comeback, you know, because the polls, uh, 
you know, have been against him or Biden's been winning in the polls. Um, again, we talked about the polls. It really going to come down to that, those electoral college swing states, not so much uh, have to do with the, uh, with the polls or the national um, averages. Uh, we really have to kind of look race by race. Uh, so it is possible uh, for a Trump win, despite kind of what the polls are telling us at this point. Uh, campaigns are rushing to cement their Facebook ads ahead of time. So we've covered a little bit of this back and forth between the social medias and um, election campaigns rhetoric uh, and of course trying to uh, cut down or reduce or eliminate, I guess, the um, uh, untruce or mislead in truce uh, on, on those platforms. And, uh, you know, where we've seen Twitter and Facebook taking down certain ads or certain posts uh, that uh, were, not, uh, were not factual or, or certainly misleading. Um, and, uh, of course, one of Facebook's uh, policies they put into place is the last week before, uh, once they're in the last week of election, no campaign ads or no political ads will, will, be, uh, will be run. Uh, and that was just their way of trying to reduce any last minute slander, last minute misleading ads. Uh, whether that's the right move or not, it's going to be hard to tell. Um, obviously, uh, they, did, they are going ahead with that. So there was a rush for the campaigns to get all their ads submitted prior to that last week uh, as we're now into it and uh, no new ads will be coming up. Uh, so let's take a look at what's, uh, what's going on. As we mentioned, Microsoft is uh, quietly preparing to avoid some spotlight under Biden. They've picked up some pretty good contracts uh, under the Republican government, uh, 10 billion contracts uh, that they took away from Amazon for, for one. Uh, and, and, but they've been a significant backer in the Biden campaign as well, just hedging their bets to make sure that they're still, they're still in favor there if, if we do see a change in government. Chevron is making some moves. Uh, we've seen a lot of consolidation, costs cut in, uh, restructuring happening in the oil and gas sectors. Uh, just, you know, with this, this low price and difficult time uh, for, for oil and shale. Uh, Chevron's, Chevron's moving to the Middle East a little bit where they had been focused on U.S. shale. They're moving uh, a lot of focus over there. Uh, it's been volatile over there in that divided region. Uh, a lot of companies have been wary to kind of step into it, but Chevron uh, has decided to focus there and see if they can't take advantage of that. Uh, Synovus and Husky uh, have merged or announced a merger that will create the third largest uh, oil major and a Canadian oil major in the country. Uh, a lot of concerns, Synovus Energy taking a, a stock hit after that announcement. Uh, it's an all stock deal, so there's no, no cash. It's a straight stock merger. Uh, and uh, they also came out this morning and announced that there's going to be 25% of the staff to be laid off. So some good news, some bad news there, you know, in these, when we see all the consolidation in these areas, of course, that means fewer jobs as they remove duplication. And 25 is kind of just right off the top what they estimated. Uh, but over time, as uh, management positions get consolidated, uh, regions get consolidated, we'll probably see that number increase. So uh, from the job front in the energy sector, not good. Uh, it does create a more cost-effective powerhouse here in Canada, though. So we'll watch that play out a little bit over the next couple of weeks. Uh, other news out there, the U.S. housing. Uh, so last week we talked about we were waiting for the U.S. Uh, new home sales. Uh, actually, we were expecting a little bit of a, 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 a uptick. We certainly have seen in Canada. This is the first time in kind of the North American markets we've seen a drop. So uh, we're still seeing um, we're still seeing an underpinning of the 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 price in in the market, uh, mostly driven by and we talked about it last week is that low in the low borrowing rate, the low mortgage rates are keeping people in the market. But this is the first time we see kind of in North America that drop on the residential in the residential space. So um, is it a concern? It might just been one month movement. I mean, obviously unemployment is still up really high. The second wave is a massive concern in all areas. Uh, are we seeing people taking their foot off the gas pedal when it comes to, to real estate in the US? Could we see that following in Canada? Obviously uh, something to keep a very, very close eye on, but, um, but it is an indication here something to, uh, that we are seeing a little bit of fall off for September.
So we'll watch, uh, watch the October numbers with some uh, extra, extra scrutiny. Uh, White House advisor uh, Kudlow says the uh, COVID-19 uh, aid talks continue. So this is kind of the back and forth on the, the stimulus package or the targeted stimulus package. Of, of course, Trump has squashed a, uh, a full package until after the election. Uh, but Pelosi and the Republicans were still working on trying to do some targeted uh, stimulus or uh, relief for certain sectors, certain areas. Um, it's been back and forth. It's gone to the Senate a couple of times. At this point, uh, I'll be actually a little bit surprised if, uh, if we do see, um, see anything before the election, given we're, we're into the last week. Uh, the parties will want to wait to see if they have control and, and uh, what they can uh, maybe have uh, come up with a better deal you know, if, if, if they have more... Uh, more solid ground to stand on. Obviously the Republican and obviously the Democrats obviously would be able to uh, do a lot more um, if they had, especially if they had control of the Senate and the presidency. Um, US uh, appeals the World Trade Organization ruling on the tariffs in China. So we talked about this last week, not a big surprise. Uh, China uh, challenged at the trade organization uh, I keep touching my eyes. Sorry, I know we're not supposed to touch our face. I'll have to uh, go wash my hands right after this. But um, the World Trade Organization had ruled against the U.S. Uh, on uh, some of their uh, China tariffs, or the tariffs they had been imposing on China uh, back in 2018 uh, that was breaking global trade rules. Uh, so the U.S. is appealing that. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll go argue it. They'll, they'll drag it out for a while. Uh, not surprising. And after the election, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, we're probably going to see this, uh, maybe if we have a change in government, uh, maybe some change up on, on the tariffs, but uh, certainly expect the tariffs to continue uh, as, uh, as the U.S. try to shore up their economy and, and make sure that um, they, uh, they can reduce that uh, jobless rate. Uh, an orderly Trump win would be favorable for the market. So everyone talks about kind of the equities, the outcome. Uh, and really, this is J.P. Morgan kind of coming out and saying, you know, the best outcome for the market would be uh, you know a Trump win and um, you know no no no, con no no contest to the election. Um, really, all that saying is, is is what we've talked about many many times before. Is the uh, the market doesn't like uncertainty, so uh, you know call it the devil you know. So if the market says okay, well Trump wins again, uh, that's not a political view. That's just the market saying okay, well, we already lived with it for four years. We know what to expect for the next four years. Uh, there's no transition. There's no downtime. There's no shift in policies, uh, you know. So the so the markets uh, would find that favorable uh, right on the outset. That doesn't mean that we'd expect a downturn if the Democrats were to win. Um, just simply, the markets would, you know, probably be a little bit slower in the rebound as they wait. The market the investors wait to kind of see how and what the uh, the Democrats are going to roll out. Uh, you know, I saw a headline the other day and actually had a couple of people call me and, and comment, you know, will the market crash if Biden wins, if the Democrats take control because of the tax they want to put into place and this other, you know, other things that they want to do. Uh, keep in mind, those were the exact headlines going into the, the Obama election. The first the Obama win in his first, uh, his first term was that the Democrats were going to bring about this downturn. And what, we, what did we see? We, we saw great markets under, uh, uh, under the, the Democrats in Obama. In fact, most of what we've seen in the last uh, three years in, uh, under Trump was the tail end of a bull market coming through the Democrats' um, uh, or, or tenure in, in office or in the presidential seat. Uh, it, they, they still have to push things through Congress. They still have to push things to, through uh, the Senate in order to get anything done. And also keep in mind, Biden under Biden, the Democrats are probably the most center uh, they've been in a long time. If, if we were talking about a Bernie Sanders presidency, obviously that's way to the left. You know, we could see a lot more uh, dramatic change or, or try to implement more dramatic change quicker but we're talking about a pretty centrist government if the Biden camp wins. So certainly we're not expecting a, a massive pullback if uh, Democrats win. Uh, we, we will probably see a lift day one, just knowing that the Democrats, you know, were through this election. 
that we know who's the, 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 the next party going to be or, you know, who's in charge. Um, and then how quickly we see that rally will depend on kind of how quick they announce or roll out what their policies are and, and the timing of those things. So while I agree with JP Morgan, we'll probably see things quicker and faster with the devil, you know, uh, but I don't necessarily agree that it would be uh, bad or negative for the markets uh, if the Democrats were, were to go in there. <clears throat> we're also seeing uh, the big, one of the largest IPOs uh, coming out here at 34 billion uh, investors are lining up for the Ant Group. So this is a um, Chinese uh, fintech uh, giant uh, that's going public. Um, it, it should do well. We're keeping, a, keeping an eye on it. it. 34 billion is a lot for the market to take again in the middle of all of what's going on. Uh, you know, the IPO market uh, tends to be a little uh, outside uh, of uh, kind of the day-to-day -day trading. Uh, and there's certainly a lot of interest from institutional investors on it. Uh, as we look every week at the numbers out there, um, you know, quickly approaching the 44 million total cases worldwide, uh, 1.166 uh, total deaths globally. U.S. over the 230 mark now as far as total deaths. Canada pretty much on the 10,000 mark now um, in, in the second wave. Uh, so not good. I know Quebec has just extended their closures. Uh, BC obviously uh, have have dialed back yesterday the the number of our inner circle or inner bubble groups. I think it was around ten. Uh, we're down to six again. Uh, so you know more more tightening when it comes to um, uh, the uh, not just exposure or, or personal exposures, but also uh, you know businesses. Uh, BC's even uh, calling for a mask anywhere in public, whether it's a rule or not. Uh, if you're in a public place, uh, you should be wearing a mask. Uh, obviously, good news. Uh, we actually, hold on. My team was telling me I got to show. We now have Canaccord Genuity branded masks. Um, so, you know, we're always wearing them when we're out and about. Um, well, I haven't worn mine yet. As you saw, it was still in the bag. But we, we are supporting the effort. Uh, and obviously, back east where the numbers are even worse, uh, Ontario has closed down some more areas. Uh, and that's complete closures. They've closed down uh, some, uh, it, you know, obviously in-person dining, uh, just going back to takeout. And Quebec have extended their closure for another 28 days of uh, no gyms, salons, uh, in-person dining, um, and, and pretty much most social activities. Uh, you have no inner group, no visitors allowed at houses um, and everything else. Uh, so pretty tough on them out there. And I do have a son in Montreal right now. So he is held up in his room. Uh, all the teenagers seem to be okay with playing video games online. So uh, I, he seems to be in good spirits. So let's see what's going on in the markets. Uh, we did see that big tumble yesterday in the market pullback. Uh, what was driving it? Uh, really uncertainty around the election, as we mentioned. Uh, obviously, the second wave numbers are, are concerning, uh, especially around the oil and gas sector. Uh, you know, if we go into another shutdown, uh, you know, even further drop on demand, uh, you know, we can see flight restrictions again, obviously the numbers in Spain and France and all through Europe really are, are almost at or higher than uh, the March levels when we saw those, uh, the travel bans in place. Uh, we could easily slide into that uh, on a global uh, basis. Uh, so some sectors obviously being really nervous going into, uh, into this week. And on top of that, of course, the election uh, that's going on. We mentioned Microsoft uh, is, is coming out with their sales, really looking for a, a really solid uh, first quarter for them, uh, sales earning as uh, people, uh, you know, have set up their home offices, new equipment, new softwares, their cloud services have, uh, sales have been spiking. So a lot of good news around the Microsoft, uh, the Microsoft name. Uh, the Commerce Department is uh, likely to show uh, new orders for the durable goods to be up. Uh, now, keep in mind all these indicators that we're looking at. We are looking in a rear view mirror, so we always have to take into account, uh, A, how much they've rebounded during that reopening, uh, how much they uh, pulled back at the closures, 
Uh, if we do go into a, a second round of closures, um, you know, it gives us insight into what we can predict going forward. So always keep in mind when we talk about economic numbers, most of them are rear view mirrors to give us an idea of how things react or how healthier things are getting again. But really when we look at the investment side of things, we want to, uh, we want to look at, you know, what that, what that's telling us about moving forward. How quickly are things recovering? Are they recovering at a pace that we're expecting or are they uh, slower than expected? Uh, in which case then we, we should show concerns over different things. Uh, Pfizer is set to report their third quarter earnings as well. Uh, you, you know, while in the investor outlook, um, uh, they're, they're looking into the experimental vaccines for COVID-19 from, uh, from that drug maker. Um, and, and that's something we're watching with all the drug makers seeing, uh, you know, how they're doing Johnson and Johnson we talked about last week. Uh, and, um, and we've seen a few of those trials go on hold uh, and then get restarted again as, uh, as they come through, uh, you know, different stages or, or, or different results. Uh, but the latest numbers we heard, we won't get the results for the earliest trials until early to mid-December. Uh, and other U.S. top news, uh, Fiat and PSA uh, get approval from the European Union uh, for their merger. So that's a couple of car manufacturers uh, merger and, uh, you know, uh, coming together, uh, cutting costs, uh, funding cleaner vehicles. Uh, we've talked about, you know, kind of the clean tech being a push. Uh, we're seeing that uh, globally more so than in the U.S. Uh, of course, the, the, the current administration in the U.S. has not really pushed uh, clean tech, but around the world, it has been a bigger move. Uh, I was even uh, doing some research into a company called uh, Polestar yesterday, um, which is a, uh, a Volvo um, and a Chinese company, uh, come, Volvo racing team come together and, and, and they're, they've just brought out, or they're bringing out in January, their new affordable, uh, fully electric vehicle uh, to North America. Uh, so more and more around that clean tech, especially in the car area, uh, which is good. For, um, and uh, and this it looks like a good merger. Of course, again, we'll see job losses in the traditional manufacturing, but at least see the pickup on the clean, the clean tech side uh, as they expand out their product lines in those areas. Hasbro re revenue has slipped, uh, and this has really been on the on the media side, the movies and TV shows. Uh, of, of course, you know, movie theaters, movies in general have not been out this year, uh, but also productions have been halted. So between uh, lack of production, lack of new TV shows, uh, you know, they've seen a fall, only a 4% fall in adjusted revenues. Not too bad given uh, the amount of impact that they've seen. Starbucks and Yum! Brand, Sales uh, are, are going to show likely a recovery from, from their earlier quarter. Of course, they did reopen quite a bit, uh, but they also incurred a lot more cost in keeping employees and, and people safe, whether it's been equipment, uh, lower, um, lower occupancy, uh, you know, longer lines. Um, Yum Brands, if you're not familiar, is kind of the Taco Bell, KFC, Pizza Hut uh, brands, so kind of your fast foods. Uh, so they continue to, obviously, a lot of them continue to del the delivery services during uh, the, the earlier shutdown. We've seen them reopen, uh, but extra cost is probably going to push down, uh, push down their, re their profit numbers as well as have to pay some higher wages during that, that, uh, that process. Uh, the U.S. is fighting, you know, they're fighting tariffs uh, over in, uh, in China, as I mentioned, with the WTO. Last week, we also mentioned the w WTO. Uh, ruled in favor of the EU to put tariffs on their uh, to the airlines um, against the U the U.S. anyway U.S. Ma airline manufacturer, and that's yeah, that's not a trade war. That's just simply whenever an industry gets subsidized by a government, other governments try to even the playing field uh, from a pricing perspective. So U.S. is again, you know, <clears throat> not happy with the EU for for putting those tariffs on and are trying to negotiate or block some of those uh, by putting together a, uh, a negotiated resolution as opposed to a tariff solution. So the U.S. continues to, to work on that, especially on the battered airline industry, uh, which is one of the ones that uh, Congress and Senate are trying to negotiate some sort of package for, some sort of stimulus to help it out. Uh, obviously, a lot of pressure, especially if we go into this next shutdown, 
uh, and, and Bowen in particular, because they had the, the 737 MAX 8 uh, fiasco uh, prior to the pandemic closed down. Uh, over in India, uh, India's uh, Future Retail, which is a uh, online retailer, uh, has been working on a deal uh, to sell its assets to uh, Reliance Industry, uh, which is another one. Uh, so uh, they've been going back and forth trying to get the, the, the deal approved. Um, you know, the arbitration has, uh, has been arguing against, uh, you know, Amazon's in there trying to uh, scupper the deal, you know, try to bleed out some of those assets. Um, they're looking for a legal order to, to block Amazon out. Obviously, Amazon's trying to get a bigger piece of the pie while they're trying to keep things uh, kind of in the country with uh, Reliance Industries to try to get them to expand and take over that business. Coming up in Canada, we've also got our rest, uh, Restaurant Brands International report in the third quarter. Restaurant Brands is kind of the Burger King, Tim Hortons, and also Popeye's Chicken. Um, and the performance of Tim Hortons and Burger King has been uh, or expected to be down. Uh, Popeye's, however, has seen a bit of a surge under their brand uh, with the popularity of their chicken sandwich. So uh, probably mixed results there, but expecting it to be a little bit lower. Uh, tech resources is also expected to, uh, to see a bit of a fall there um, as they've seen some slowdown and uh, some, some issues with their chili projects. Uh, during, uh, during the last couple of months. Overall, though, mining, I think, has been good. Just uh, they, they've had some particular challenges there. Uh, Canada's uh, Synovus, as we mentioned, they're going into the merger with Husky. Uh, we saw their shares uh, tumble a bit uh, after the announcement. Uh, and, of course, with the layoffs, uh, there's a big group restructuring to, to happen there, uh, even though it's a merger. Um, purchase merger uh, looks more like a merger uh, where you see that, that many layoffs happening. Uh, right off the bat. Canada Brookville Business Partners uh, is buying up uh, Genworth. Uh, so they already own 57% of Genworth, uh, but they're increasing that position. Uh, again, consolidation, consolidation out there. Whenever we see lower valuations, uh, the stronger will always try to buy up more assets so that they can recover quicker and also um, uh, take advantage of the situation a little bit. Uh, spirits, uh, spirit cuts the price uh, for Bombard. Yeah, so again, a common theme in, in the middle of all this. Deals that had happened, Spirit Airlines looking to buy Bombard uh, aerospace, uh, aerostructure, a uh, piece of their business uh, was negotiated prior to the pandemic. Uh, this is similar as Air Canada negotiating with Transat prior to the pandemic. The deal got renegotiated um, and, you know, the price is coming out 45% lower. Uh, for, for Bombardier to, to, to go ahead with it. Same thing we saw on transit uh, or air transit. Uh, you know, again, as mentioned, if, if you're in any position that there was a deal negotiated prior to the pandemic, I would be very cautious about uh, that being renegotiated depending on what side you're on, uh, whether you're on the buyer or the, the seller side, the seller's probably not going to get the, the, the full pre-pandemic pre price that they, uh, that they went in for. Uh, Canada's, uh, the Ontario is about to release their 2020 budget. This is really significant, not just because a provincial budget, uh, you know, obviously some deficit spending through the pandemic, um, but Ontario's, you know, the world's largest sub-sovereign borrower. So uh, of any non-federal borrower, um, they're the largest in the world. So uh, the big you know, when, when the Ford government got elected, their mandate was to deal with that debt, bring that debt down. And of course, through the pandemic, they've had to spend more. Uh, so what that's going to look like, um, you know, what would the total uh, overspend uh, was uh, or surplus spending was, uh, but also how they plan to uh, deal with um, kind of going forward the, 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 into 2021, uh, how they plan to get that under control. Uh, and, and continue to try to run, drive that mandate to reduce it. On the foreign exchange, US dollar, a little bit firmer on Monday, but still under pressure. A uh, common theme we've been talking about for, for months now, uh, the US dollar under some, uh, some pressure. Uh, obviously, a lot of focus on the fiscal spending, uh, talking about the second relief package, uh, you know, what that's going to mean. So uh, really, uh, I don't think that's going to change much. Um, Obviously, a little bit up and down as we see the markets uh, move, 
uh, that flight to safety. So probably a little bit of upward pressure on the US dollar this week uh, as we see flight to safety going into the election. But again, if we see positive markets after the election, uh, that, that will probably pull back. The euro stabilized during that, uh, as we saw the, the US weakened a little bit, same with the, the pound. Um, we're seeing more data out this week, but not likely to change uh, much on those fronts uh, with the Lumen election in the US. We've been talking more uh, recently about digital currency, so everyone knows that more as Bitcoin. Uh, obviously, there's more than uh, one uh, digital currency out there, Bitcoin being uh, certainly the biggest in the news, uh, which has also been surging back to almost its highs from a couple of years ago uh, after it had a massive pullback. Uh, obviously, concerns around currency. Also, a lot of more talk from central banks around the world about coming together uh, with the digital currency. We talked about the regulation issues uh, behind that and uh, how they how they could possibly deal with it um, and, 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 and how they would transact globally. Uh, there's obviously a lot of advantages to it, uh, but also a lot of concerns. Uh, the Canadian dollar this morning was at 7602, slightly down against the US from last week, um, but by, um, I think it was 70, uh, 7620 last week, uh, so 7602. So not a big move, uh, but it's slightly down from last week. On the commodity front, real no change on the crude front. Um, again, no demand pressures. So the price is staying low. Still a lot of concerns about a second shutdown uh, and also the Libyan increase in their output, which, uh, which dilutes the market down as far as uh, pricing goes. Uh, so really no upward movement there, no no strong buy. Um, uh, in, in fact, I would stay stay fairly away from the, the, the oil sector for the, the next little while anyway. Gold holding steady, a little bit of move up yesterday and today. Uh, you know, just still above the 1900 an ounce. We've seen that rally uh, over the last few months uh, as we, we, we look at um, more inflation coming in the markets, more stimulus packages coming out. Uh, that's companies print or country, sorry, printing money, uh, of course, puts pressure, upwards pressure on gold. So we still think that's a good play um, to offset inflation in your portfolio. Uh, so let's talk about the best performing companies uh, around the world, well, Canada and the US anyway, um, uh, for, for this year. And really what we want to look at is the sectors because, uh, you know, some of these companies are, are long shot names. You know, the first one here, let me move my little face here. Uh, you can see 4,000% move on Trillium th Therapeutics. Obviously, this is a play on uh, pharmaceutical uh, into the um, vaccine or treatment areas. Uh, and we see that column through these top 10 here, uh, Well Health in there, Apollo Healthcare, um, the Cena Therapeutics, um, uh, uh, all kind of in that healthcare sector. Uh, showing, uh, you know, massive growth this year. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, if you're looking at making a play in those areas uh, or any areas where there's a lot of different speculation across the sector, you know, it's hard to, to really narrow down as a, a disruptor, someone who's coming, you know, really ahead of the pack, uh, you know, do consider ETFs where you can get a portfolio of those and take advantage of the growth in the sector. Obviously, there's been really great, great growth in the overall sector, um, rather than trying to pick that one name. The other, uh, the other obvious winners we see in here is the minerals. We talked about gold, copper, nickel in previous weeks. Uh, they, they've all been doing well. You know, gold inflationary, nickel and, nickel and copper. Uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of speculation, of course, with all these new uh, battery-run uh, cars and equipment. Uh, you know, all that takes those metals to, to build those batteries and, and, and build, the, uh, build the units themselves. Uh, so Oro Minerals, Jaguar Mining, uh, Skeena Resources, uh, you know, are all up there uh, as a sector uh, doing quite well. And, and again, that would be a sector you might want to consider an ETF rather than trying to pick kind of one name out of there. One that surprised me was, was, was Sunopta. Um, they're actually, um, you know, non-meat, you know, the, their symbol being soy. Uh, so they're plant-based foods. Um, you know, they're in the kind of in the top for the year. So kind of breaking the trend a little bit. So it's an interesting one. Um, not all the um, alternative uh, food uh, makers uh, have done as well as them. They've kind of come from behind. 
uh, through all this, obviously uh, shape, shaping, uh, carving out some really good market share and, and coming out with some uh, unique products. On the US side, uh, Etsy. So everyone shopping from home, looking to buy those uh, hand knitted masks, I guess. Etsy, if you don't, uh, if you don't follow them, uh, a lot of um, art, you know, artist created uh, products uh, that you can find uh, locally in a lot of cases, but it's kind of a, a central hub for uh, people to sell their wares uh, uh, online and uh, been popular for a while, but obviously as people stay at home, uh, gaining a lot of uh, a lot of attention. Uh, NVIDIA uh, Corporation up there. NVIDIA, uh, I think I've mentioned them before. Uh, if you have kids or if you yourself are a gamer, you know exactly who they are. They make um, chips and uh, digital video cards for uh, for video gaming uh, consoles. Uh, and they've, uh, they've really knocked it out of the park this year with uh, not just earnings, but their their advancement in products um, and, and the demand for their uh, for their video card, the video graphic card, uh, is skyrocketing. So they're doing quite well. Dexcom, West Pharmaceutical, again Pharmaceutical, PayPal, again one of the ones we've been talking about for a while. Definitely in our portfolios, as everyone's um, buying online, uh, they're out there, um, uh, you know, collected. It's one of the online payment forms. Uh, so they're doing quite well. Sorry, skipped over Dexcom. Uh, Dexcom, uh, software manufacturer or developer rather. Uh, so, you know, as people need th this different softwares to work from home or companies trying to get remote access for their employees. Advanced microchips, so the chips and all that hardware that people are out buying. L Brand Service Now, another software company. Amazon, no big surprise. And FedEx, as we buy everything online and ship, uh, ship it around the world and around the country. Uh, they've, they've done exceptionally well. So as you can see, not a lot of surprise into the sectors that are, or the companies that are doing well and, and again, focusing on the sectors. But really uh, why I wanted to highlight that the top 20 uh, is not really to put focus on them as an area where you should buy into at this point uh, because rarely do you see top performance in one year and see that replicate again in the next year. Really what we want to see is the trends uh, where, where money's flowing, where, you know, where people are spending money, what sectors are doing the best. Um, but, uh, you know, if you own any of these companies, that's great. That's fantastic. Uh, you might be some opportunities to take some profits out of there and really look for the next, you know, the next company or the next sector that, uh, that that's going to recover and, and grow. And there's a lot of areas and we'll do a deep dive, a future video into, uh, into kind of where we see. We've done some already for this year, which kind of highlighted a few of those sectors that, uh, that we, we highlighted today. Um, and we'll do some more as we go into uh, post election markets uh, and, and really highlight where we think what areas of the market are gonna be the best for the next three, six months, 12 months, uh, or even a couple of years as we see that rebuild of the economy as we see people um, get back um, and get back around the um, uh, getting people back to work. Sorry. Uh, just reading a question we have, I'll, I'll quickly jump into it. I know I'm, I'm running near the end of my time here. Um, we got a, a, the question is basically, uh, you know, some mix uh, miss messages out of the Biden camp uh, in regards to the U S support of the oil industry. Uh, any direction on that or in Alberta oil? Uh, no, for sure. Biden's, uh, Biden's camp, um, you know, has been a little cautious about what they want to uh, say about uh, supporting the oil industry versus the Republicans, obviously really pushing, which they have. Uh, you know, the energy sector has been a focus of the Republicans for the last four years. Uh, fossil fuels has been a focus uh, to grow that and support that industry. Uh, really what I would think you should take out of the Biden camp, and, and we've seen this in a lot of other countries, including Canada, when it comes to the energy or specifically the oil sector, uh, and Alberta being an example, is um, the, the governments, and I've mentioned this before, the best estimates that, that we've had in our industry looking at the fossil fuel or the oil sector uh, was that oil would be on a steady decline by 2030. Basically meaning, not that oil would be gone, not that we wouldn't still use oil, just simply 
the demand, uh, the demand would be on such a steady decline due to shifting in technology. Saw the same thing happen to coal. Technologies got cheaper, technologies got more efficient, and we stopped using coal as much uh, for a power source, right? For running the generators and, and, and creating electricity. So we started shifting away from that. So we saw a steady decline on the, on, on the coal industry. The best estimates, the most generous estimate pre-pandemic was 2030, we were gonna see uh, oil hit that downturn. So for countries to invest in bringing back an economy or creating new jobs in, in what they see as a decline in industry, uh, it's really tough to, to you know, know that you're going to go hire someone and in 10 years or train someone up, hire them, and, and in 10 years that job is not going to be there. Or there's going to be a lot fewer of those jobs. It's, it, it's difficult to put a lot of money behind that. Uh, but it's also different, difficult for a country to shift that focus. What the pandemic has done by hitting the reset button basically on energy, by closing everything down, killing demand globally, it's allowed them to say, hey, we're going to fund that industry, but we're going to put that funding into the fact that you have to now focus on, and we call it clean tech, but alternative energies outside necessarily the fossil fuel. And that's what Canada has been doing uh, with Alberta is saying, like, here's some money, go hire people back, but start to put a lot of investment into alternatives, build that other side, start building that other side. It's going to take time hire, create the new jobs in that side of it or the sector that is not only going to last longer than 10 years, uh, but the job opportunity is going to expand over the next 10 years in those areas. Uh, that's what the Biden can't, they, they've actually put a trillion two aside for clean tech, they've called it, but really it's to shift the economy, to catch the, the US economy up to the rest of the world where they've fallen behind in the last four years on that side of things to try to create new jobs and create new investments around that. Doesn't mean the energy companies are going away. Doesn't mean that uh, they're not gonna get support or recovery, it, but a lot of money under the Democrats, I think, will be focused on expanding or diversifying that business away from solely the fossil fuel side. Um, and a lot of smart companies have already started that, but the government support, I think, uh, under that will, um, you know, show up more, the Democrat side will show up more in that form as opposed to a complete uh, subsidy of the energy fossil fuel sector, which we'll probably see more likely from the Republicans, certainly if they continue the trend uh, for the first four years of pushing away from the clean tech side of things and, and, and trying to recover or maintain that um, traditional uh, business. So with that, I've talked too long as usual. Thank you everyone for joining us. As, you, as always, next Tuesday at noon, we'll do our live broadcast. We just posted um, our, one of our Friday deep dives into uh, life insurance. I've gotten a lot of questions from people uh, from, from the website on you know, whether they should use it or when they should use it. So I kind of did a deep dive into uh, the pros, cons, when you might want to consider it, not consider it, uh, when you should really consider it. Uh, and, and how to apply that tool. So go check that out at mikeonmoney.com. Uh, we hope to see you again next week. As always, send in your questions, send in your comments. Uh, always happy to chat uh, with anyone uh, and uh, answer any of your questions. Take care and enjoy your week.